I'd like to stop for just a moment and have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of worship. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that come from your word. And thank you, Father, for the messengers that you send. We love you, Jesus. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. And we are so thankful to be in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord. We love you, and it's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. So we have the opportunity and the pleasure of having Brother John Abner with us tonight. He is coming to bring the message, and uh, thank you, sir, for being with us. God bless you. We're looking forward to hear what God's laid on your heart. Thank you so much. My name is John Abner. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. When Moses texted me a couple weeks ago if I would come, I, I jumped at the opportunity because... Um, one, uh, I, I know how much he loves you, his faith family, and if he is going to trust me uh, with you, I, I, I don't want to miss that opportunity. And, and second, uh, my family and I have recently gone through, uh, the, for us, the worst imaginable year um, and Moses has relentlessly stood by my side as we've gone through things. Um, a quick, just a little understanding of who I am. Uh, I am an old construction worker that at 22 put my trust in Christ Jesus. I, uh, I barely graduated from high school. I, I can read, but I don't retain. I, I have a really hard time remembering um, anything. My relationship with the Word of God started out by my now wife of 17 years, but she was my girlfriend at the time, reading the Bible to me is how my relationship started. We uh, have been married. We moved here from Kentucky uh, shortly after getting married. We have two amazing daughters, 10 and 4. Um, I, I served at a church as youth pastor for 10 years. Slid into uh, the position of lead pastor for four uh, when my senior pastor, uh, my spiritual father, retired. And um, out of nowhere, I really felt compelled to step down a few years ago. I didn't know why at the time, but I, I do now. And uh, I went back into the construction industry. I, I currently am the deputy building official for the city of Mount Dora and um, am, uh, uh, have gone from preaching 150 times a year uh, to about 15. And so I'm super excited to be here. Um, my wife and I, hey, thank you. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we are, are currently missionaries to Russia. Uh, we're planning our next trip in September um, where I'm gonna be taking my, my daughter with me. And so I'm super excited about that. We'll spend several weeks there. Um, I've been given the opportunity to teach in the seminaries while I'm there, but more importantly, uh, while we're there, my wife, who is uh, regional special ed director for Lake County Schools, my family will be with me tomorrow. They're, they had uh, uh, something already tonight. But um, uh, while we're in Russia, she educates on how to uh, uh, educate and love on children and adults with special needs. And so um, she'll spend weeks speaking and, and visiting and pouring into not only parents, but also um, those that have been entrusted with children with special needs. And so uh, we're going back to follow up with that um, here in, in about a half a year, God willing. And so I am so excited to be with you today. Um, in the uh, immortal words of Willie Nelson, I woke up still not dead again today. And so it's, it's a good day. Um, James 1 says this. It says, if you hear the word and walk away and don't remember it, then you're actually deceiving yourself. And I have a hard time with that verse because I read the word and walk away and don't remember it all the time because it's a struggle that I have. But one of the things that it causes me to do is it causes me to read the word and read it again and read it again and read it again. And eventually, through reading short passages of Scripture, all of a sudden, things start to jump off the page and things start to come alive. And so I try really hard in my life not to be one of these people that are deceived because I'm forgetting everything that's being taught to me, either through 
another pastor or someone that's speaking or through my relationship with the word personally. And so I wonder if it's possible that we could be a people that are extremely biblically literate but are also deceived. We know the word. We can spout it off. We use it against other people. But yet we have a hard time walking in love the way that maybe God has loved us. Or walking in a grace that, come on, church, every single one of us are desperate for. And so here's what I'd like to do. We're going to look at a pretty good chunk of, past, of, 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 the, of the Scripture in Joshua chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, go ahead and turn to Joshua. It's right after uh, Moses' law, Deuteronomy. You go right into Joshua chapter 1. We're going to read that passage. I'm going to read it. I read from the English Standard Version. So whatever translation you have, just follow along. And my goal tonight is for us to, to take a moment to kind of, kind of meditate, and not in a, like a mystic, weird way, but just to kind of think and ponder on what this passage says. Think about what God was doing with Joshua during this time. And then we're going to bring it home. And look at what it means to us when God is with us. So Joshua 1, I'm going to read the whole chapter. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given this to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward going down the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I find it interesting right there that God says you will make your way prosperous when you're obedient to his word. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua, he said, remember the word that Moses the servant, the Lord commanded you, saying the Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and all of your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you, they shall pass over armed uh, as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, a servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. Verse 16, And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us we will do. And whatever you send us, wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all these things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and disobeys your word, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Let's just pray real quick. Father, I thank you so much for the night. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I pray, Lord, right now that your word would go forth on fertile soil and that it would produce fruit and fruit that remains. God, I pray that that fruit would be lives changed for all eternity, not only here tonight, but God, everywhere we go. May us loving and sharing your goodness and your grace and your word of truth to those that we come in contact with, may it plant seeds in their life. 
And Lord, when you see fit, I pray that we would reap a harvest. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So I, I, I kind of appreciate the way that God deals with Joshua. He says things over and over and over again. That's how I remember things. i simple-minded, right? Just tell me. What would you say again? Tell me. And he says three, or two things three times. One of them I know that you picked up on. Be strong and courageous, right? Be strong and courageous. And Jesus did the same thing. When Jesus was ministering in the land, he would say, and again I say unto you, and again I say unto you, and again I say unto you. And so God is wanting to get something through Joshua's mind and get him to understand, listen, be strong, be courageous. And there's another phrase that he says. He says it three times. It's a promise. And it's a promise that he is going to be with Joshua. And so this is what he says. He says it, uh, uh, at the end of verse 5, God says, just as I was with Moses... Here it is. He says, so I will be with you. A promise to Joshua. And he says, I'll be with you. And then he says it again. He just rephrases it. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I know that's a phrase that we're familiar with. The second time, and then he goes on at the end of the passage, the end of verse 9. He says, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so three times he's talking about being with them. Uh, it, this isn't the first time that we see these, these types of phrases. If you go back just a few chapters uh, into Deuteronomy chapter 31, you see this. It says uh, in, in chapter 31, verses 1 through 6, Moses is speaking to Israel, and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me <coughs> that you shall not go to this Jordan. And so here, God is with Moses. He's like, look, you're not going to go across the Jordan, but Joshua's going to, so don't, don't fret. He says, the Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall um, uh, dis dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did. And he goes on to give all of these examples. And he says, do not fear or be in dread of them. It is the Lord your God that goes with you. He says here at the end of verse 6, he says, he will not leave you. And he will not forsake you. And so then another verse later, Moses is speaking directly to Joshua. And he says, you're never going to believe what he says to him. He says, he summoned Joshua and he told him inside of all of Israel, he said, be strong and be courageous for all that I give you. I'm going to be with you as I take you into the land that the Lord has sworn to the fathers to give them. A little bit later in 31 verse 23, God speaks directly to Joshua. In verse 23, the Bible says, the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun. You know what he says? He says, be strong and courageous. For you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. And you know how he closes that? He says, but, but don't worry. I'll be with you. I'm going to be with you. And so there's a promise that God is giving that he's going to be with Joshua. But he says, if I'm going to be with you, I need something out of you. I need you to be strong. And I need you to be courageous. And this is what I want to think about, our time together, our, our short little time that we have tonight. As I started to forget this. Two years ago, I was in my home, my neighborhood over in Mount Dora, my grandmother and my grandfather lived about four houses behind me. My daughter, she was about eight at the time. She was swimming in the pool with her cousin. And my grandfather, a man who I, I love and respect very much, was standing out by the pool deck with him. And he got up out of the table to walk over to him, and he slipped and he fell. He hit his head on the deck of the pool. My grandmother calls me frantically, and I, I run over, and my daughter and her, her cousin are there. I grab my grandfather's head and he doesn't die in my lap, but several days later in the hospital, he passed away. What my wife and I didn't know is that it was the begin, 
the beginning of a chain of events that were going to happen almost every month. Between my wife and I, we lost six grandparents in eight months. Blessed to have that many, but lost them all in a very short period of time. And then everything culminated almost one year ago, March 31st of last year, the night before Easter. I get a phone call from my mom. My mom and my dad, they got a divorce when I was two years old. I was raised by a single mom. She's my hero. She gave everything for me. She was mom and dad all of my life, took care of me, everything that I could possibly imagine. And so I've made it a point in my adulthood to take care of her. I was very fortunate that she found a man that loved her very much, was very kind to her, and uh, struggled with a mental illness. And the night before Easter last year, March 31st, he pulled a pistol out. My mom is laying five feet away from him. She says, Tim, what are you going to do, shoot me? And he proceeds to put it up underneath his chin and pull the trigger. I get the phone call, 911 on the other line. I beat the paramedics to her house. I jump on the bed, I throw the towel underneath his chin. My stepfather dies there on the bed. Now, I had no idea that those things were coming. I'd already stepped down from victory. I had no idea that these things were happening. But God did. God knew that there was zero chance of me loving on anybody <laughs> in those months after. And I'll be honest, it's still a little difficult, but I'm getting there. I had no idea the social anxiety that was going to build up inside of me and have a hard time just being around people that totally contradicts who I am. I had no idea the things that were going to happen in the aftermath of this one-year period. And I'll be honest... quickly forgot that God was with me. I quickly forgot that he called me to be strong and courageous. And I'm thankful for men of God like Moses. Your Moses, not this Moses. <laughs> that called and prayed and held me accountable in the midst of just wanting to give up everything. And I'm certain that he's done it for many of you. And it drives home what our brother said earlier, that we have an opportunity to love on him and take care of him and pray for him and support him. I, I commission you, I charge you as a church, as a faith family, to do that very thing. Because of prayers, from mighty men of God like Moses, I am preaching again. I am getting healthier thanks to mental health counselors and all kinds of different things. But I did remember that God was with me. And what I want to do tonight is I want to take a few minutes to remind you that God is with you and what that means. Because hear me, Christian. How does God's presence create strength and courage? What effect does knowing God is with you have on you? Now, if you're not a Christian, if you've never said yes to him, this is, means nothing to you. And let me just say, if you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never accepted him as your Savior, or maybe you did it one time and you've, you've forgotten. Maybe you're very much like me. A, thing, a, a, a chain of events happened and, and, and you turned to, to decided to turn away from that relationship. Let me remind you what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Paul is the simplest example. He's walking down the road. All of a sudden, there's a bright light and he's blind. A little bit later, through another chain of events, the Bible says that like scales from his eyes fell and he could see Jesus. Saying yes to Jesus is this. At one point in my life, I didn't know I needed him. And then, once blind, now I see that I can't live without him. 
And if you've never said yes to him, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, I need you. We don't need the right song. We don't need the right crowd. We don't need the, the altar call. It's just a matter of you saying And when you say yes, this amazing, thing's hap this amazing thing happens. He comes and he dwells inside of you. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But hear me. God is with you. It's what he said to Joshua over and over and over again. It's what he's reminding me every single day. I've been with you all of this time. Even in that moment that you thought that I left you, I promise I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I don't know what you're going through, but I've got a feeling that what we just read and what we're talking about, it, it soaks in into a lot of lives in this room tonight. Think about what we just read and what it means. Personalize it. When God is with me, what's it mean? Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. When God is with me, I have confidence amidst uncertainty. When God is with me, I have confidence amidst uncertainty. If you've read Deuteronomy and Joshua, you know this. In the aftermath of Moses dying, there was uncertainty in the air. People didn't really know what was going to happen. Their leader had just died. It's a lot what my family is going through. You see, you think, well, losing grandparents, you know, they're older, and you had a lot of time with them, and you were super blessed. But what we didn't account for is that they were the matriarchs and the patriarchs of my family. And, and, and in about eight months, all the leadership of my family, gone. The ones that... Can, you know what the best thing about grandma and grandpa is? Is they can say whatever they want to you without fear of what you're going to do in return. <laughs> I don't get that privilege with the rest of my family. But grandma and grandpa did. And if I was wrong, they'd tell me I was wrong. And if I looked stupid, they would tell me I looked stupid. And they didn't care to do it. And they did it from a place of love. But they had that ability. And just like that, it was gone. The ones that, in, that, that planned the dinner and you had to show up at, gone. All of these things missing. And, and that's a lot of what's happening here in Joshua. There's uncertainty. That leadership is gone. And, and, but the great thing is this. And, and God does this from the very start of Joshua. He lets them know. He's reminding them. He says that after the death of Moses, the servants of the Lord. He's reminding them, look, Moses was just my servant. And no, he's not with you anymore, but the important thing is I was with you then, and I am with you now. And so yes, he's gone, but I'm still here. And so even though it's uncertain times, even though we really don't know what to do next, the good news is, is that I'm still here. He goes on in verse 5, he says, just as I was with Moses, I'm also with you. And so the good news is, is that it's not the man who leads God's people that matters most. Ultimately, what matters most is the Lord that leads his people. And when he is with his people, we can have confidence amidst uncertainty. We apply this to our own lives. I'm doing it every single day just to get through. Someone that we've looked at, someone that we've looked to, Maybe a spouse, a husband or a wife, a, a mother or a father, a boss at work, a, a friend that you used to, to rely on, and all of a sudden, they're gone. In those moments, there's uncertainty in our lives. It happens at work. It happens at home. It happens at church. All of a sudden, we find ourselves in this, this cloud of, of uncertainty. But hear me tonight, church. Into that cloud, God whispers with crystal clear clarity, I'm still with you. Do this for me tonight. 
in the midst of whatever is happening in your life right now, because we know this truth, right? You've either just gone, come through something, you're in the middle of something, or something's coming. Like, we know this. This thing is not easy. But in the midst of whatever is happening, hear God say to you, I'm with you. You can be confident in me. You can trust me. It might feel like I'm gone, but I'm not. I'm right here. You know what he says? He says, don't put your trust, don't put your confidence in your circumstances because they're going to change and they're going to fail you. Don't put your confidence in this person or in that person. He says, put your confidence in me. Put your confidence in my presence that's with you. Because when God is with you, you can be confident even amidst uncertainty. The second thing, you have strength despite weakness. You, Christian, have strength despite weakness. In verse 5 there in Joshua chapter 1, God says, just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you, Joshua. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And he says, so be strong. Be strong. Remember, Joshua, you remember this from Children's Church back in the day? Felt boards up on the wall. This is what happened. Joshua tried to lead the people of God before. You remember? Twelve spies went into this land. And they came back. And they're like, it's amazing. It is a land that is flowing with milk and honey. It's plentiful. It's a great land. Let's go. But then 10 of the spies said, oh, hold up. Did you see those people? They're monsters. They're too big. They're too powerful. It's a great land, but there's no way that we can go there. They will overtake us. And Caleb and Joshua are standing up saying, no, 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 we can. God's given us this land. Then, in your Bible's Numbers, chapter 14, Joshua decides again. He says, All right, I, I can convince them this time. I got this. I'm going to talk them into going into that land because it's too good to miss. And so they listened to him, and you know how they responded? They were ready to stone him. And so now that Moses is dead and Joshua is left to lead this people, that the last time he tried to leave, they were ready to kill him, he knew it wasn't going to be easy. He knew it was going to be hard. Joshua knew that left to his own abilities to lead these people, he was going to fail. He knew there was no chance. He knew he couldn't do it. And so God says to him, he says, I'm with you. In light of all of this that's going on, in light of you being weak, no, I'm strong. And I'm here and I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you. Have you ever felt in over your head? Maybe you feel it now. In over your head, in your marriage. 17 years in, I don't have anything figured out. All I know is that I love her more than I ever thought imaginable. You know, I found out, so the day that we're getting married, December 15, 2001, I, I told myself there is no way that I could love this woman any more than I love her right now. We were young knuckleheads. I was 23, she was 19. We're in the middle of Kentucky. We have no idea what life is and what it's going to throw our way. But I was convinced Five years later, I realized that on that day, I didn't even understand what love was compared to how much I loved her then. You know what I know now? At five years, I didn't even know what love was compared to what I, what I know and how much I love her now. You know, I'm going to be standing 30 years from now 
I was in this church one time, Revolution, over by the Home Depot, and I was telling them how much I loved my wife. And you know what I know now? I didn't even know what love was. There is nothing like living off of ramen noodles and Kool-Aid that'll teach you and forge something in you. And I don't know about you, but I miss those days. I had no debt, no possessions, no money, no food. Life was good. Our last year in Kentucky, we spent a whole summer with no air condition and a whole winter with no heat. In Kentucky, you have to have oil to heat your house. We couldn't afford any. But something happens during that time. But there have been moments that I fell in over my head <laughs> as a parent. I feel in over my head all the time. We had our first daughter, Isabella, sleeping through the night at seven weeks, did everything we told her to do. We never once had to put up a baby gate or one of those things in the plugs. And, and we, looked, we looked down on other parents that their kids didn't listen to them. We were like, just send them with us. We're amazing parents. <laughs> like God's little bait and switch. Because then we had kid number two. And she... Uh, I'm surprised DCF hasn't taken her away from me yet. <laughs> I am telling you, this kid, and, and, and she's beautiful, and she was getting in trouble the other day, and, and her mom, Kendra, my wife, she was yelling at her, and, and uh, Gabriella looked up at my wife and just winked at her, went, <laughs> and winked at her. How do you continue to punish a kid like that? I'm in over my head. I'm in over my head. I can't do it on my own. And so to the Christian men and women, husbands and wives, moms and dads, employees and employers facing all kinds of situations, let it soak in. God is with you. And he gives you strength despite your weakness. Third thing, when God is with you, you have courage in the face of fear. Three times God says, be strong, be courageous. Why do he say it so many times? The implied answer is obvious. Joshua was scared to death. God knew if I don't keep reminding him to be strong, he's going to run away. He's going to flee. He's looking at the land of Canaan, and at this point, Canaan was divided into 31 different city-states. And Joshua, not Moses, is the one to lead them to take over, to conquer all 31 of them. How's he going to do it? And not only is he called to take over all of them, he's starting with this pretty little town, maybe you've heard of it, that's got these massive walls around it called Jericho. How's he going to do it? What's he going to do? God says, <laughs> even though there's much to be afraid of, I'm with you. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And then hear what he says next, verse 6, Joshua 1, verse 6. He says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Now that's good news if you're Joshua. That's God saying, look, you're the reason that these people are going to inherit this land that I promised to give them a long time ago. If you go back to verse 3, this is what God said. He said, every place your foot touches, it's yours. I'm going to give it to you, just as I promised Moses. Every place that your foot steps, 
Verse 4 in Joshua 1, he says this. He says, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all this land is going to be your territory. And so here in the midst of this, we have this guarantee from the almighty God. And that is reason to have courage in the face of fear. Joshua hasn't even fought one battle. But God has already promised him the promised land. He's guaranteed him victory. Don't miss it. Please, Christian, don't miss it. When the God, capital G, the one true God, the only God that is sovereign over everything, every people, every nation, and the universe, when this God is with you, you have zero reason to be afraid ever. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what makes you afraid. But I do know that when the God who spoke in all creation came into being, the God who reigns over all creation in all nations, the one that holds this thing in the very palm of his hands, when this God is on your side, you have nothing to be afraid of ever for things. You have success according to Scripture. When God is with you, you have success according to Scripture. Now, everything that happens in Joshua's life, in my life, and in your life hinges on God's Word. Hinges on it. His Word to the people. In verse 7, God says, Be strong, be courageous. You've heard that. But he says, be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from the right or to the left. And he says, when you do this, you're going to have good success wherever you go. And so know this, success is tied to obedience. Not obedience to me, not obedience to the pastor, obedience to this word. Obedience to God's word. He says in verse 8, he says, You will have success when you meditate on my word and you do what I have commanded you. And so it's interesting what happens in the next few pages. Israel's military, their success is never based on their strength. It's never based on how good their plan is. It's always based on their success. When the Israelites in their army is obedient to God, they can win a battle with nothing but trumpet players and people shouting. Yet, when they're disobedient to God, even their mightiest men fall to a small little group of people like AI. And so it has no idea, no, no, nothing to do with their confidence or their strength or their courage. Success is based, it hinges on trusting in God's presence and clinging to God's word. Whatever you're walking through in your life right now, whatever circumstances that you're facing, whatever decisions that you're making, Notice here in Joshua 1 that God does not spell out the battle plan for the military. They don't know what's coming next. He's promised them some things, but it doesn't go down exactly the way that they think it's going to go down. And the same is true in our lives. I wish that I could tell you, Christian, turn to page 50 and you'll figure out how to get through this. Turn to page 120. Well, that's what's going on. Yeah, that's over on page 200. But I can't, but I can tell you this, that whatever you're walking through in your life, whatever circumstances that you're in, God may not give the specifics of what to do today or what to do tomorrow, but God does say, stay in tune 
with my voice. Listen to my word. Hear it. Heed it. And I guarantee you success. He says, the book of this law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. I'll say this too, though. The, the, the tragedy and the things that have happened in your life they are not necessarily a result of your disobedience, and so don't put that blame on you. The death and the suicides and the things that we've experienced, it, it wasn't a result of my sin necessarily. It's a result of sin in general. And so when tragedy strikes, when people turn away from us, when things happen to us that we don't deserve and we never asked for, Instead of running from God, it ought to make us run to him all the more and hate the one that brought sin into our land. I know that we don't know the, the specifics. I know that we don't know exactly what we need to do in every situation. But know this. God is with you. And God is not silent. He is not silent. He leads his people according to his word. He does not leave his people in the dark. He's not one that is out to trick you or confuse you. He's not a God of confusion. And so cling to his word. Read it, but don't stop there. Let it soak in day and night, and he will give you success according to the scripture. Last thing, number five. You have hope in the face of despair. This passage, verse 9, it, it closes out. Just in case you missed it, he says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Christian, do not be dismayed. Do not be discouraged, disheartened, or downcast. Do not let your heart give way to despair because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whenever you get to a point where there seems no way out, whenever you find yourself in a valley where it seems too deep, whenever it seems too dark to know where to go next, when you begin to think that you can't go any farther, hear me, Christian, you have hope. Why? Not because your circumstances are guaranteed to change tonight. Not because your circumstances are guaranteed to change tomorrow. Heck, tomorrow's not even promised. But you have hope because your hope is in the rock-solid reality that your Lord and your God is with you wherever you go. My favorite scripture, I have two. One of them is Hebrews, cast not away your confidence because in it is a great reward. I like to walk through this life with a little swagger knowing that my God is with me. I've lost it recently, but I'm getting it back. But my favorite scripture is found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. And he's talking about the mystery of the gospel. It's a very simple scripture. Um, most times it, it goes uh, even without being thought about. But it says at the end of verse 27, he says, Christ is in you. That's the hope of glory. Christ in you. Early on in my Christianity, I was uh, um, easily swayed by um, teachers, whether they be accurate or inaccurate. And uh, I was taught into thinking that there was a difference between some Christians and other Christians. And that you had these regular Christians, and then eventually, if you're a good little boy or girl, you might become a super Christian. <laughs> Hear me, lies. The moment, the very moment that you say yes to him, 
he comes to dwell inside of you. It's the mystery that they didn't understand about in the old book. Because what happened? The Spirit of God would come upon them. They would do amazing things. And then he'd go somewhere else. And then a little bit later, just read any, any, any passage in the Bible where amazing things are happening. The Spirit of the Lord would come upon them. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord wasn't upon them anymore. But something happened in the new book when that veil was ripped from top to bottom. When we now had access to the Father. When we say yes to him based on what Christ has done for us. Not based on anything that we do, but based on everything that he's done on our behalf. You know, the only thing that you brought to the table in terms of your salvation is our sin. That's the only thing we had to offer. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'll take that. And when we say yes to him, he comes to dwell inside of us, but it gets better. Christ lives in you for every one of you that have said yes to him. Romans says that not only does he live in you, but it's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that lives in you. Whew. Romans 8. He lives inside of you. Ephesians 1 says that he's put his self there as a deposit in you, guaranteeing your eternal redemption. Christ, the spirit of Christ dwelling in you. And so you put your faith in him. He comes to dwell inside of you. You have the Spirit of God living in you right where you are and dwelling. But then he says this. That's not the end. Because just as Christ is in us as Christians, you know what else? We're in Christ. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And so not only does he live in me and you and you, but you also live in him. And so we bring that into the equation. We're sealed, new creation, old gone, new come. Things are looking pretty good. He's in me. I'm in him. But it gets even better. Because later on in that same letter to the church in Colossae, Colossians chapter 3, he goes on to talk about since we've died to ourselves, we are now hidden with Christ. And if anybody knows how that verse ends, he says we're hidden with Christ in God, Father. So now the Spirit of Christ that's in you, in you in Christ, that Christ is also in God. And so I don't know what you're walking through in your life right now. I don't know what situations that you're facing. I don't know what the devil and all of his demons are throwing at you. But I do know this, Christian. When the devil comes after you, he comes first face to face with God. Which is, if you've been paying attention, he doesn't have a very good track record with. And if by chance he gets past Father, oh, Jesus again. The one whom he thought he defeated when Christ died, but three days later when the stone rolled away, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, defeating death, hell, and our sin. He comes face to face with him. Genesis 3 says this about Jesus, that he crushed the serpent's head. So that didn't work out very well. And if by chance he gets past Father and past Jesus and he gets to you, he's got to deal with the Spirit of Christ that raised Jesus from the dead, that's dwelling inside of you. When you put all of this together and even compare it to our circumstances and to our situations, even on our worst days. Where you stand right now, I'd say you're pretty secure. A.W. Tozier said this, I'm not afraid of the devil. The devil can handle me. He's got judo that I've never heard of, but he can't handle the one to whom I am joined. He can't handle the one to whom I am united. He can't handle the one whose nature dwells in my nature. 
Another guy by the name of Hudson Taylor, he said, Oh, it is joy to feel Jesus living in you. He's my life, my strength, my salvation, and I am no longer anxious about anything. He went on to say this. Listen to this. Hudson Taylor said this. He said, I know that God is able to carry out his will, and his will is mine. And so it doesn't make any matter where he places me or how. This is for him to consider, not me. Because even in my easiest position, he must give me grace. And in my most difficult situation, his grace has to be sufficient. So if God should place me in great perplexity, must he not give me guidance? If he positions me in great difficulty, doesn't he have to give me grace? And if my circumstances are of great pressure and trial, won't he give me strength? I have no fear that his resources will be unequaled to the emergency. And his resources are mine, for he is mine, and he is with me, and he dwells in me. So hear me, Christian, tonight. Brother, I'll take you back up here. Amidst uncertainty, you have confidence. Despite weakness, you have strength. In the face of fear, you have nothing to be afraid of. You have courage, and he will grant you success according to his word. He gives us hope even in the deepest, darkest, most difficult circumstances. It's a blood-bought reality for every follower of Christ. This invites you to receive it. I'm going to introduce you to one thought, and then I'm done, I promise. I'm landing this plane. So I'm a big advocate of, of mental health counselors. Um, one of my best friends is a mental health counselor. I can't go talk to him because if he knew all the crazy that went on up here, he probably wouldn't be my friend anymore. And so I gotta have other counselors that I go to, and I do, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of them. Um, and so shortly after everything happened, you know, the idea of uh, PTSD was tossed around it was traumatic, right? And, and I was post that traumatic moment. And, and so there were some things that were going on. I, I, uh, I, I knew that I needed help when I started to um, really act out of character in the way that I, I spoke to my wife and my children. You know, short fuse, yelling for no reason. Let me say this, parents. If a five-year-old and their actions can cause you to scream, it speaks more of you than it does them. And when I started to act out of character, I was yelling at my daughter to stop yelling. I knew it was time. So this idea of PTSD is tossed around and whatever. But let me introduce you to another idea because I know you've all been through it. Tragedy. People have left you, people have done things to you. Hurts unimaginable broken relationships with children, loss of children's lives. Ladies and men have done things to you that you didn't ask for. And it's, it's, it's brought upon great trauma. And if we're not careful, we will allow it to define who we are. But surely, when I, surely after all of this happened and I began on this road of recovery, I was introduced with a second idea, not PTSD, but PTG post-traumatic growth. Something that can only come from the Lord. Hear me. In all of those times that you thought you were alone, in all of those moments that you never thought you were going to be able to get through, I promise you, God was waiting. And he was saying, I will never leave you will never forsake you. I miss all of those people that I've lost. But I can promise you that because of God, I'm coming out the other side better. I'm coming out the other side stronger. You see, this I know. No one comes out the other side of the fire 
regretting that they went through the fire. You see, we allow people to tell us that what we've been through determines who we are and where we're going. Everything that I've been through is just a license for me to minister. I have no seminary education. I don't have a certificate that says I'm allowed to be here. What says that I'm allowed to be here is God's word and everything that he's allowed me to walk through to get to this very place. One of my favorite sayings is that master captains are not forged in smooth waters. Hear me, if I'm going out to sea with my family, I don't want to be with someone that's never been in a storm because they're due. <laughs> I want to be with someone that's been through the hell that this life can throw at them. You've been through divorce and you've come out the other side saying, we can be friends. You've been through addiction and you're fighting that thing even to today. Let's hang out because you and I, we can do some things together because what I know about you that have been through hard times is that you don't run in the face of struggle. Instead, we come through and God has a plan with it. And hear me, there are people in Leesburg, in Tavares, in Lake County that need what you have. There's a, a single mother that is struggling with her kids that needs another single mother to come alongside her and say, I made it. You're going to make it too. You see, the reason we go to Russia is that the, the suicide rate for mothers with children with disabilities is through the roof. Because two things happen. One, they either tell them that their children is, is filled with demons or two, they tell the mothers it's their fault something they did during pregnancy to cause it. And so they can't take it anymore and they kill themselves in staggering numbers. And so our call to go there is to say, you're not alone. And yeah, your kid might get looked at at the McDonald's, but guess what? In America, our kids get looked at in the McDonald's too. And we have to help educate the ignorant just as you have to help educate the ignorant. And there's, that's just one example. You have all kinds of things that you've been through in your life. And God is just waiting for you to use them in someone else's life. They're saying, I don't even know if I can make it anymore. You see, I remember the last conversation with my stepdad. That day, I had no idea. It's not guaranteed. It's not promised. But I promise you. Today is important. Tomorrow is important. Every person that you come in contact with, love them. Get to hear their story. Share with them the grace that has been given to you. I love you all. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here with you tonight. Let me just pray. Close your eyes if you would. Let's pray. And, and then... We'll do whatever it is we do. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. God, you know the needs all throughout this room. They might not think they're going to make it, but you know they are. Help them. Give them strength. Whisper to them to be strong and courageous. Remind them that you're here. God, I pray that whatever it is, whatever it is, use it. Don't let that hurt go in vain. Use it to help somebody else. Use it to help us point people to you. And I pray that the result of this hope is lives changed, God. Lord, I, I feel like there's some people here tonight that Maybe even a hard time laughing and enjoying life. They just so, so bound up and struggling with just life. 
Give them joy that can only come from you, Lord. Just remind them, God, that you've got this. Give them joy and laughter. In Jesus' name.